Hi everyone, recently I've been experimenting with using procedural techniques in Blender to create environment art. In doing so, I've created this demonstration scene which you can pick up on Gumroad for a few dollars by using the link in the description. But don't worry, you don't need to download the file to use the techniques, as I will spend the rest of this video giving you a breakdown of how everything works. So let's get into it. If you do pick up a copy of the file, this is what it will look like when you open it up. Uh, of course, this doesn't look like the finished artwork, and that's because we've got these giant planes in the way. So if you want to just hide them, you can go to the MISC collection and hide the visibility. So overall, this is an experiment in using procedural techniques to create environment art. The idea was to see how complex you could get the results looking with the minimal amount of input. So for example, if I select one of these rock type structures and go into edit mode, you can see how it's just a very basic structure. The process that's turning this basic structure into this complex rock object is the modifier stack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to a separate file so we can demonstrate this better. So here we have the basic objects, we can take a look at the process in more detail. If I disable all of these modifiers, we can take a look at it in a step-by-step -step way. So naturally the first thing that happens is we subdivide the original shape with a subdivision surface modifier. Then we use a displace modifier to completely disrupt the surface of the mesh. And if I go into the properties of the texture that's being used for the displacement, we can see that it's a Musgrave type, and here are the parameters. Everything is of course adjustable, and this makes it very easy, say for example if I wanted to create a Python script that would generate environments like these. But once the shape has been distorted to this amount, we can then add even finer details, so I subdivide the shape even more. This is where the vertex counts start getting quite high. And then we can do an extra displacement on top of this just to add the extra surface effects. Now I've used a wood texture to get this extra surface effect because I wanted to go for something quite alien and something that looked like a dried up ocean or lake bed, something very salty where there's been some strange erosion via water, bordering on abstract, but something that looks quite interesting when light hits it. Now the good thing about this is that even with slight changes to the original mesh, you can get some very dramatic changes in the final result. Um, the reason why this is so laggy in edit mode is because I have one of the subdivision surface modifiers active. Um, here's a little tip, if you want to increase your edit mode performance, you can disable this with this button here, edit mode. So if I do this, as soon as I start moving things around again, notice how it's very smooth. Even by having this extremely smooth performance and modifying this very simple shape, when we go back into object mode, it will take a moment to recalculate, but we get a very complex result that comes out of it. So the extra layer of detail that follows on from this is the surface material. So if I go into rendered mode, we can see this. This is Eevee though, and this was designed for cycles to start with. So the lighting isn't great here. Let me add a sun lamp and increase this. Rotate it around. Okay, so you can see that we've got some slight variety of rocky colors as well as some rather vibrant veins going through the rock surface. And there's also some bump distortion. If I open up the nodes for the material here, we can see this in more detail. Basically there's generated coordinates going through mapping, which is influencing generated noise textures, and we have a variety of color ramps. Uh, this is blending together to create the base color. We can adjust the hue of the vein colors as well quite easily, which is nice. Then we have some of this data being fed into the bump node, which is fed into the normal input of the principled BSDF shader, which goes straight to the surface. Now there's no displacement happening on these objects and that's because the mesh content created from the modifier stacks is already quite heavy and having extra displacement, especially with adaptive subdivision, would be very intensive on the computer. But that option is there in case you had some sort of strange supercomputer available to you. Moving on, we're going to take a look at the ground. So the ground is interesting because most of the detail for this comes from the material, which is different from the rock objects because most of the detail for those comes from the modifier stack. But if we take a look at the modifier stack for this one, you can see that we have a subdivision, displace, another displace, and then the particle settings. So for the displacement, if I go back into the solid mode, we can take a look at the, the first one is just a clouds type. And this just gets a very basic disruption of the original surface. So nothing too intensive, just to give it a bit of a wavy nature. Then the second displacement texture is a harsher version of the clouds. This gives us some smaller but harsher bumps. And of course you can change this by changing the strength value. And because we've got particle systems on this object, you can see how the objects compensate for the change in topology. The particle objects themselves, there are two of them. There's a simple rock and a simple, like, I don't know, an extended blade of grass or something. But the idea for these was to have objects that were only as simple as could be written down on a piece of paper. So if you wanted to do it completely procedurally, say have Python generate all of these environments, it would be quite simple to do that because there's few enough vertices that, as I say, you could write it down on a piece of paper so you could hard code it very easily. 
inside of the material for the ground, you'll see that there's a fair bit more happening than the original rock material. Uh, this was taken from the procedural rock material because you can see some similarities, but there's a few more nodes going on. You can also see that down here I'm making use of vector displacement that's being plugged into the displacement input of the material output node. Now substituting this with regular displacement would work fine because I'm not making complete use of the vector displacement node at the moment. And for those of you that don't know what it is, it's usually used in combination with the adaptive subdivision modifier. And to be able to access this, you need to make sure that you have your cycles set to the experimental feature set. Basically, adaptive subdivision allows you to make use of micro polygon displacement, which might also be known as tessellation to some people, but I'm sure there are some subtle differences in the definition somewhere. And what displacement will do is it will take those newly created vertices and it will typically move them up and down along the normal axis. But what this means is that these vertices can never overlap. So you can never have overhangs of mesh content creating concave areas. But where vector displacement is different is that it does allow for these overhang areas. I am not making complete use of the vector displacement here, but I've put it here because the option is now available. If you wanted to have certain areas extruding and then overhanging other areas, we could get shadowy effects completely made by just the materials alone that is available to do. Stylistically, the idea here was to get something that was, again, alien, but also sort of reminiscent of a salt flab, but also a tiny bit rocky with some protruding floral elements. Just so long as, at the end of the day, most of the detail came from the material. Coming back to the original file, I've enabled the MISC collection, and one thing you'll notice, if you look very carefully, is that there's some fog slash mist effects going on. This is not done by using volume, this is just done by using a couple of planes. Now I've used this technique in the past because it saves on rendering time, and what I've done back then is I've painted white on alpha transparent images of, say, dust particle effects or some fog effects, and that's been quite effective, but I thought since I'm trying to do this all procedurally, is there a way to do this procedurally as well? And yes, of course there is. It's of course quite ridiculously simple, you just take a plane and you put a generated noise texture on it for a color ramp and we can combine, say, an emission. You can use a diffuse if you want, but what emission allows us to do is to keep the light levels of the plane separate from the light source objects in the scene. In this case I've chosen Musgrave on the four dimensional version, and the reason for that is so we have access to the W seed value, and you can see that if I hold shift and scrub this, we can get different sort of foggy effects. And of course, if I take the second handle on the ramp here and reduce it, this basically acts as our opacity value. So you can see how we can get some makeshift fog type effects that the background will seep through. Taking a look at this again in the final scene, if I increase the opacity here, you can see how the effect is much more obvious. As for the world lighting, it's fairly simple. I'm just making use of an environment texture that comes from HDRI Haven, which I of course recommend you take a look at, and I think they also have a Patreon. They allow you to download lots of HDRIs for free, and they also have companion websites such as Texture Haven and Model Haven. But of course, as you can see, there's not just an environment texture going on. This is a little technique for keeping the background of the rendered scene different from the environment texture. Take the light path node, and you take is camera ray, you feed it for a mixed shader node, and then by doing this, you can separate what the actual background in the render will look like compared to the actual environment texture. Whereas if I plug the environment texture straight into the surface, you can see that, you know, it looks weird because we've got the pixelated background here. So by doing this, we can control the actual background color of the scene. But I choose to keep it on a subtly blue, thick atmosphere type color, because I think that works out for this type of scene. So yeah, as I say, the amount of effort required to make this scene is very small, absolutely minimal, because the rocks are basically just cuboid shapes, and there's two particle systems here, just a very simple rock and a very simple blade of grass. Everything else is done via modifiers or materials, so I'm quite happy with how it's turned out. The whole purpose, as I say, was to see how viable it would be to create some sort of uh, environment generator just for short to mid-range types of artworks like these. I encourage you to play around because Blender seems to be quite powerful in this department, although there's a lot of potential, and I'm still waiting for things like everything nodes in the future, which should hopefully open the way for even more possibilities. I've also had the Sphere Chalk add-on recommended to me, and I've been quite excited to try that out at some point, but I really wanted to restrict myself to the vanilla version of Blender. This is currently 2.82. So yeah, I encourage you to play around with the techniques. I mean, you can recreate what I've shown you in the video, or alternatively, if you want to support me, you can pick up a copy of this finished blend file. It's available for a few dollars on Gumroad by using the link in the description. Okay, now we're coming to the end. We're gonna take a minute to talk about the sponsor for this video, which is Sketchfab. You may already know Sketchfab for providing the best 3D model viewer for the web, but you might not know that they actually have an online store for buying and selling 3D models. You can use the built-in model inspector to preview the geometry of the mesh, along with all the textures, so you know exactly what you're getting. 
There's a wide variety of content available and a good number of dedicated artists providing high quality content. If you're interested in maybe selling your own models on the store, then you can also consider applying to become a seller. So thanks for sponsoring this video Sketchfab, and thank you to all of you for watching. Remember to pick up a copy of the finished resources using the link in the description. You can also subscribe, follow me on social media, and join our Discord server to keep up to date with content. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.